Well, what does it precisely mean? What did you start in this lifetime? What is it that you start in this lifetime? You entered the path, that's it. You enter the path of accumulation. That's what it means. To enter the path of accumulation and in that lifetime you go through preparation, seeing, meditation, no more learning. But that's only possible with Tantra. Only possible with Tantra. So you enter the Tantric path of accumulation, Tantric path of preparation, Tantric path of seeing. So all the way through Tantra you enter those five paths. That's what it means to be enlightened. So what about all that preparatory work to get there to get there so that in this lifetime you're able to enter the minor path of accumulation. That's not in one lifetime. So if you don't believe in reincarnation, don't even bother about becoming the Buddha. No, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> it's still good to work towards it. But if you really think about it, it's not realistic. No, no, I didn't mean the first part. It's not realistic. So it takes a long time. Everything takes time. And if we jump the steps, then with regard to a teacher, how do we come to know a teacher as a Buddha? It takes a lot of time, a lot of analysis, a lot of research, receiving teachings, how do they affect me, researching this person. And that doesn't mean you have to be physically around them, because when you're physically around them, they're just going to try and squash your ego. And that initially could lead to a lot of misunderstanding. They're mean. This Lama is mean. He doesn't treat me well. Right? So they actually say, if, you, if you're not ready, do not rub shoulders with your lama. You may, it may lead to a lot of misperceptions because all they're trying to do is crush your ego in the fastest way. And you have to be ready for doing that. Okay? So it's not going to give you all the attention and all that. It can be very painful. If you're ready for that pain, well, seek out the lama. Okay? I mean, of course, they're always do as much as you can take, but still, if, you, if you're not ready to take it, well then, you know, maybe take a little bit of a step back and continue researching. Okay, okay, anyway, sorry, uh, there's no, there is no clear-cut answer, I cannot really answer it unless I say a lot of things as in like, look at the teachings, look how they affect you, etc. And that's good enough in the beginning. And just allow the possibilities that they are enlightened. But then it's still so important, of course, to look for the right kind of class and not end up with some villain who was basically... I mean, that also happens, so we have to be careful. Okay. Yes? I want to ask if, if you don't believe in reincarnation, then you don't believe in some then you don't believe in enlightenment. Why do you get an this now? Well, people make it work with samsara. They like, might kind of like, yes, it's samsara. Okay, and then they aim for liberation because they've heard liberation, but even that takes three lifetimes, actually. Even liberation, if you start on the path of accumulation, you need at least three lifetimes. Yes, so actually, but people still believe it's possible nonetheless. Or they believe Buddhist practice is effective just for this lifetime because it makes them feel better, and that's great. That's great. I have no problem with that. My take on reincarnation is allow at least the possibility. Mm -hmm. Because we don't know right now, but to be decisive about it doesn't exist, you're not doing yourself a favor. Right? You've heard me oftentimes say, believing in the possibility of reincarnation and karma is a win-win situation. No matter what you do, it benefits you. If nothing happens after death, there's nothing afterwards, let's say that were the case, then at least you have no regret when you die and you've been a good example to your children and everyone around you. If there is heaven and hell, as suggested, for instance, in Christianity, well, you go to heaven. And if it's the Buddhist way, you're well prepared. So it's a win-win situation, what's the problem? So to at least allow the possibility. And of course, very important to think of all the reasonings. To really spend some time with the idea of reincarnation, with stories, with anecdotal stories, with the anecdotes of people remembering past lives, etc. Okay, anyway, the way to take refuge now, how do we take refuge? Well, by knowing the good qualities of the three jewels. When do we take a break? Ten thirty or whenever I feel like. 10.30 or whenever I feel like. Are you still, got some energy? Time to turn, okay, to go.
All right, this category involves recalling the good quality of each of the three jewels. So, the good qualities of the Buddha, well, it's basically saying it's not really possible to understand the qualities of a Buddha, to accurately understand them. So it says in the Uttara Tantra, because he has transcended the world, our worldly comparisons miss their mark. I think of it a little bit like, think we are blind, and we have been blind since birth, and we're now trying to understand what blue looks like. Right? We can discuss it, blue is like this, blue is like that. We can get a rough sense, but of course in the end we miss the mark. But it's better than not thinking about it at all. But when we reach this point where we think, nah, that's not really possible. Well, that's just because with our mind, we feel it's not possible. Okay? I think what comes to mind is that the Buddha can emanate so many different Buddha emanations at the same time. I have a hard time just being myself. <laughs> being more than one person, more than just one person is so difficult. But that's just because we have such a sense of I, I, I. We can only be that one person. If that sense of I disappears, you can manifest in different ways and be more than just one person. But that seems impossible right now, right? That's, I think, one thing that comes to mind that's so beyond our uh, grasp. But nonetheless, we should at least try to get a sense of the outstanding qualities of an enlightened being. So four subtopics are here described. This is still all part of the Lama Chemo, but we're almost done with that and only continue with another text. So the good qualities of a Buddha's body, speech, mind, and enlightened activities. Now, again, the good qualities of a Buddha's body Buddhists have eliminated all shortcomings. They do not have an ordinary body of flesh and blood. That is so hard to understand because when you look at His Holiness, if His Holiness is a Buddha, then that's not an ordinary body of flesh and blood. It just looks like that. Right? It's so hard to... But again, it looks solid. We totally believe the scientists that this is made of seven particles. We totally believe that. It looks like the sun rises in the east. We even talk like that. We totally believe scientists that that's not the case. But that the Dalai Lama may have a body that just appears to be a flash of light. Oh, no, 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 no. We don't believe that. Isn't that bizarre? In a way, right? I mean, yes, you can't prove it to us right now. Okay, but right now you can't prove to me that this is made of subtle atoms. <laughs> you can't prove it to me right now. You can't. It seems so solid, everything seems so solid. And before I met science and believed that they know, have all the answers, <laughs> and I thought this was blue and this was green and there was nothing about it. I've just been trained since I was very little. Okay. So that helps me. But basically, a lot of the things that appear to us, the fact that water is only water because of our karma, right? We have the karma to perceive the Dalai Lama as just being ordinary. We have the karma to perceive liquid as water, certain liquids. Okay, so why do we trust so much what we perceive if in the end it's due to the karmic actions we accumulated? Instead, a Buddha's body is a mental body that may appear to be flesh and blood, but is free from all impurities. That's why the bodyguards, when they, after his holiness, has spent a whole day walking around, they, and they left, leave his shoes outside, they take his shoes and they sniff, <laughs> and it smells really good, they say. I'd like to sniff those. I never had the opportunity. But they're saying there's no impurities, there's no body smell, because our smells in our bodies, because of impurities, again, because of actions in the past. They say the body guts, they all sniff his homeless shoes. They say it's incredibly nice. And, and, and his homeless walks around in those shoes all day long. And he, he, he prefers not to wear leather shoes. He wears like, and can you imagine, the smell in like plastic shoes or synthetic shoes? Yeah. So that's just one example. And this is really like you talk to the bodyguards and they say, yeah, we all take a sniff. <laughs> Not all of them, but the ones who get the opportunity. Yes. My karma is that uh, I am going to see a uh, sure. witness as a human being. Yes. I will smell issues and maybe I will have another smell. Right. But the thing is, there is something from this, the power of the object. 
that if you have, if you're totally obscured, then it doesn't happen. But there are also levels of obscuration. So, like a preta being would just perceive something disgusting. But I don't think we, we, we in some cases, of course, we have certain impurities, but not in all cases. So it's not like we're just caught in this karma. And there's then otherwise we couldn't perceive the Buddhist teachings, right? So it doesn't, there can be a very powerful karma that abstracts us from that, but it doesn't have to be. And the Tibetans, they are also so interested in his wholeness, poo and pee. <laughs> <laughs> I remember the story that there was a monk who, who, who built a device in his wholeness's toilet in Japan <laughs> to get the poo and pee. His wholeness caught him. <laughs> And he had to throw it away. So this made him throw away. He said, "Those times are over. We don't need to get." You know, the, the, I, I stayed with a Tibetan girl. She stayed, lived with me for two years, and she came from Tibet. And she had this clay that was soaked in lama pee, and they ate it all the time. I couldn't eat it. <laughs> my my mind is too. <laughs> I mean, really, if I knew the lama, maybe it'd be different. But I didn't know the lama. This plastic bag of this clay, pea soaked, clay soaked in pea. <laughs> and they rubbed it in their faces and they ate it, but they knew the lama. So, <laughs> so this is, but this is not said to be a good idea. I mean, it's not encouraged whatsoever. But it goes to that extreme, right? And not many people do it. Nowadays, anyway, they don't do it. But if a person is really pure, then none of those substances can actually harm us, right? And even disease, that's why the Tibetans don't say the Dalai Lama gets sick. They really believe he's a Buddha. They say his wholeness manifests sickness. They don't say, they don't talk like we talk. There's a way to say it in Tibetan. His wholeness manifests sickness for our own sake, right? It's really hard to believe, but it takes time to come to that kind of understanding, right? It takes a lot of time. That's why learning about this is so important, to get a sense this is possible through the little things that we see are possible in our own mind, just having purer thoughts as a result of you know, certain practices and getting to understand that all our thoughts have an effect on our body. I mean, the fact we have pains if we have more worries, right? energy in the body. It's like all in understanding how our body in the end comes down to energy in the body, right? And I create these energies with my own mind. So a lot of understanding needs to come in that you understand if someone has a pure mind and if they've had it long enough, their body will be different. And so this here is the extremist case. So we just learned from little examples and from there we basically try to infer that on a larger scale, that is possible in an even wider sense, in an even more radical sense, mm -hmm. right? Okay. All right, anyway, so uh, Buddha is mental, so actually it's made of mental, and mental in the sense that it's the subtle energy, the subtle energy that goes along with the subtle mind, in that sense mental. So really the tantric explanation is the, the best explanation. So mental, not that, it's really the mind itself, but it comes from within the wisdom of understanding of emptiness, and then together with the subtle energy, that gives rise to the body of a Buddha. <coughs> the qualities of a Buddha's, body, Buddha's body are usually explained in the context of the kayas, the presentation of the kayas. And the original meaning of the Sanskrit word is that which is accumulated. So kaya really just means that which is accumulated. The Tibetan word, ku, Ku is actually the honorific of Lu, and Lu means body. Supung is another word, but that's more colloquial. Lu actually is the written word, Lu um, is body, and Ku is the uh, honorific form of that. So that's why we say in, in English also the bodies of a Buddha. But the Kaya, the word Kaya, doesn't have the connotation of, of body as such, but that which is accumulated as a result of certain practices. However, the kayas of the Buddha do not literally refer only to the physical aggregate, but also to the enlightened beings themselves, to their various attributes and so forth. So to understand the kayas a little bit better, it's a little complicated, but you need to gain some understanding of that. There are three types, three types here. 
And these three are not the way they usually are explained. Um, there's, they're explained in a different way when you talk about three. That's in a little footnote. But basically, those three could help us to understand a Buddha's body a little bit better, Buddha's qualities. First is the Jnanakaya, the Sambhogakaya, and the Namanakaya. So the first one is just the Buddha's mind. That makes a Buddha a Buddha, his, his mind. In the same way, we are who we are because of our mind, because of our mental consciousness. That basically defines us. The Dharmakaya encompasses more than the Buddha's mind. The Dharmakaya, usually, the yes, when you talk about the three bodies, they mention the Dharmakaya, which includes the Jnanakaya, the mind of the Buddha, and it also includes the, uh, the Svabhavakaya, which refers to the cessations in the continuum of a Buddha and the emptiness of the Buddha's mind. But that's too difficult to understand, the cessation of a Buddha's mind. It's just the absence of obscurations that used to be there in the former continuum of the Bodhisattva at that time. Okay? So I didn't want to mention this in the beginning. It's in the footnote. It says that the emptiness of the Buddha's mind. How can that be a Buddha's quality? Hard to explain, hard to understand. Just as hard to understand that the emptiness of our mind is Buddha nature. Okay? There's a connection between that. The fact that our mind is Buddha nature, our lack of inherent existence is Buddha nature, and the fact that the lack of inherent existence of the Buddha's mind, just being a continuum of our own mind, in the sense of our own Buddhahood, right? That mental consciousness continues on until it becomes the mind of a Buddha. And once it's the mind of a Buddha, the emptiness of that mind is called the Svabhavakaya. It's a kaya, it's a quality of the Buddha. Okay? It's the natural quality of the Buddha, they call it. Okay, anyway, without going into all this, you see it's a little complicated. That's why I didn't say Dharmakaya, which encompasses more than just the mind of the Buddha. I'm just saying Jnanakaya. That's the mind of the Buddha. So basically when we think of a Buddha, initially it's easiest to think of an amazing mind and an amazing body. So the Jnanakaya, that is the, the amazing body. Sorry, mind. The omniscient mind of a particular Buddha. Um, so the other two kayas, they are aspects of every Buddha, and therefore they're Arya Buddhas, like Aryas, because they're realized reality, and they're just different physical manifestations of the omniscient mind of a Buddha. So there's the Samboga Kaya, and there's the Nirmana Kaya. The Samboga Kaya is just to understand that the mind of a Buddha, the mind of a Buddha comes along with a subtle energy. Okay, like every mind comes with a subtle energy. And a Buddha is only there for the benefit of others. So no way would a Buddha not manifest a body. It doesn't have to, for his own sake, doesn't have to. A body is not necessary. In our case, it's not a necessity, it's just a result. In our case, we have a body because our actions manifest in the physical manifestation as a result of our mental consciousness in the past. In the case of a Buddha, no need, there's no karmic result that karmic, I mean, from the side of the Buddha, like a karmic result. No, it's rather Buddha's mind is just there. But because the Buddha is driven by compassion, the Buddha will manifest in the form of different bodies. So the most basic body is the Sambhogakaya. And that is perceived only by Arya Bodhisattvas. Only, this is the purest form in which a Buddha can manifest. It doesn't get any purer, purer. But that kind of body is only percept, can only be perceived by beings who have a, a very pure mind. So Bodhisattvas, once they've experienced emptiness directly, that mind can be perceived by them. Not previous to that. Um, and Therefore, no one who hasn't reached that state can perceive such an Arya Buddha, the Sambhogakaya. And it's in a special realm, again, but the realm, don't think of it as an objective state. It, this realm could be right here, but you're only in that realm if your mental consciousness can perceive. Touch the objects around, see, hear what's going on around you. And only Arya Bodhisattva can do it. And such a Sambhogakaya only just teaches 
Mayana Buddhism because the people listening to them are only interested in that. However, um, there are other forms, and those are the ones we are interested in. Nimanakayas, they're called Nimanakayas. So the Sambhogakaya is that the greatest form in which a Buddha, the purest form in which a Buddha can physically manifest. But then there are other forms which are less pure, um, which are more ordinary, because otherwise we couldn't see a Buddha. So that's the, what's interested for, interesting for us. And there are actually three types, an artisan, an incarnated, and a supreme Nirmanakaya. So those are the, the names given to them. Um, artists and Nirmanakaya, it's very interesting. They're usually artists, emanations of artists. So arts is a very powerful means to teaching. I mean, a teaching in itself can be art in a sense. What is art anyway? Something pleasing, that ideal teaches us something. So look at the great lamas. Many of them are great artists. For instance, Lama Zubarumpiche. He's an artist. He does a lot of uh, visual work. Um, he's written books, right? I mean, there, in, in a way, it's art. Writing a book is, is an art. Um, a teaching can be a form of art, kind of conveying something in a way that people find it pleasing. Um, for instance, Taisito Rupachi is a great artist. Taisito Rupachi. And also they're very interested in art. Amazon Rupachi is very interested in art. Uh, Jadu Rupachi too. Jadu Rupachi knows a lot about the, the way the Buddhas are uh, depicted, how there's a certain size that was then determined by the Buddha himself, so goes the story. And it's said to be proportionally most effective through the mind. That's why when you buy a statue, you want to buy a statue that has the right proportions and doesn't, you know, sometimes they have huge hands or their faces are, you know, done in a way that doesn't accord with the proportion. So there is said to be an inspiring way in which a proportion has an effect on the mind, and therefore those statues should be uh, bought. In Tibet, you don't even say you buy a statue, you say you invite a statue. <laughs> so you don't buy a statue, you invite one and get some donation for it. <laughs> so, um, so art is very, very important, the form of art. Yeah, of course, all the tankas, yes, yes. Because we are very visual, so objects that please our mind, and the tankas, the reason why the Tibetan, like the Tibetan uh, monasteries, they're full of tankas. But it's got nothing to do with these objects, really, like the, the psychology behind it. It's not so much that you have to do that, or that there's a rule or something. It's how the mind works. When we see these images, our mind, takes on the different, right? We're inspired, it, it affects us. The smell, it, that's why you have incense. You, you burn incense, of course it's meant to be an offering as well, but also psychologically, it has an effect on us because we only, usually we burn it when we sit down to meditate. So if then you smell it somewhere, the moment, so initially it's just as an offering, it's meant as an offering, but every time you smell this, your mind goes into a meditative state, right? You go, Ur. So in the monasteries, they burn a lot of incense again. You go in there, and then, ah, and your mind kind of becomes calmer, right? So this is the, 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 the purpose of these temples. It's like a, an object where you are reminded of the Dharma, you go back to the Dharma through visual cues, and uh, what would you call those? Oral? No. It triggers, yes. Like smell cue. I mean, yeah, it triggers. It triggers certain states of mind, visually, verbally, and then you got to put some symbols and stuff going on, or <laughs> some chanting. Yeah. So you have all all those three. Uh, getting active, becoming active. So therefore, art is so important because that's something pleasing to the senses, and that's the way to trigger something in our mind. Okay. And then there are all these stories. You can read them about. You know, on your own, like this, the stories, and whether they're literally true, I don't know. Playing the lute with like no string and still playing better, they're just beautiful stories. I don't know whether that's actually realistic. You could read this <laughs> when you're on your own, but it makes sense, doesn't it? That a 
that um, uh, a manifestation manifests as an artist in a way in which the Dharma is presented in an, yeah, in, by way of art. Can we see the Sambhogakaya body? We cannot see that. No, Although no it way. Says that it's as a physical, um, physical body. Yes, but only perceived by Arya Bodhisattvas. Ah, the Arya Bodhisattva perceived this? Yes, yes, yes. Yes, only Arya Bodhisattvas. Because what kind of body would that be if only Buddhas perceive it? That's useless because a Buddha doesn't. A Buddha, a body is only manifested because otherwise, how can we communicate? We can't communicate with the enlightened mind of a Buddha, we can't perceive it can't directly perceive it, we can only infer that it exists, that's possible, but that takes at least an understanding of emptiness. And so, therefore, to, to benefit beings, the purest version is the mind, the Sambhogakaya, and that's only perceived by Arya Bodhisattvas, in other words, by Bodhisattvas who realized reality. So there's the artist in the Manakaya, and the incarnate in the Manakaya, they're just ordinary forms, they don't have to be artists necessarily in order to benefit sentient beings. They can be born as humans, as celestial beings, as animals and so forth. Even as inanimate objects such as bridges, boats and so forth. I don't know, it's really difficult, you know, like this bridge is a Buddha. We don't know, we really don't know. <laughs> I mean, yeah, if they can manifest as anything and we have the karma to be benefited in that moment and there's no bridge around, they would manifest as a bridge, right? Anything, they, they're basically all around us at all times. There's no place where there's no Buddha. Therefore, they can be anywhere. And whatever we need, it could be a manifestation, you know, like you're in a desert and suddenly there's a little tent. Could be an emanation of a Buddha. Could be a Bedouin. <laughs> just pitch this tent right there. <laughs> Don't know. But just to get the sense of that idea. Supreme Namanakayas, well, they're emanations of Buddhas who manifest the 12 deeds. They're described as historical or founding Buddhas, founding Buddhas, as in like when the teachings are gone, then historically, Maitreya Buddha will be the next Buddha to then. Uh, once the teachings are gone after Buddha Shakyamuni, how, how much longer are they going, supposed to be around? How many more years are Buddha Shakyamuni teachers set to be, teachings set to be around? No, no, not that long. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're set to be around altogether 5,000 years. So 3,600 are already gone. So 2,400 to go. But, but, Buddhism will, I mean, it's already on its way out. If you look, monasteries, no longer monks and nuns, right? They have a problem recruiting more monks and nuns. So eventually it'll be a system where just in the family, there's going to be a little altar, there's going to be a little worship, and that's pretty much it. So they're like, um, they're prophecies. It's very interesting, when we study the Abhidhamma Kosha, it talks about different times being the time of only realization being the time of study and realization. Guess what the time is right now? Degenerating anyway. The whole time from the Buddha onwards, it's degenerative, it just goes down, down, down. It's the time of studying the Buddha, Buddhism. So much study of Buddhism, so a, few, a lot less people to actually go into long-term retreat, right? And it's exactly the way it was prophesied, That's, it's really come true. We study this as part of the Abhidharma Kosha, and the period is exactly this, when people are less interested in really long, uh, dedicated practice, like Lama Tsongkhapa, you know, went into retreat month and month, for three, four months. Previously, when the monks in, in Drepungan and Sera, when they were done with their studies, they went into retreat. Now they go to the United States. <laughs> no, not always, but you know, many of them go off into different countries, right? Um, so it's really true, this is the time, but of course, the advantage is, if you practice at a time when things have so much degenerated, your practice is more effective. So in general, that's the case, but if individually you we're really hard. This is said to be even, this is more degenerate than even 100 years ago. Okay, 100, 200 years ago. So a lot more practice done in Tibet, in other countries where Buddhism was, was uh, 
to be found, Mongolia, you know, the Himalayan regions. Very, this great degeneration. In, in Ladakh, the monasteries are empty. So maybe a monk or two, and that's it. And so now young people are interested in the Dharma. They're studying the Dharma. Okay, there's a lot of young people now, but there's more study than actual